so I really want to use essentially 2017 as the big year when we just roll up this, the, these things and have these programs shut down. And I, I have only been openly targeted for a year now and I am already at breaking point, so I cannot understand what it must be like to live through hell like that for 20 years. And, and how dare they? That's, that's what really annoys me. How dare they right. do that to another human being? Um, so, so I think, you know, I, I, what I really would like to do is now give people encouragement to come forward and tell them about progress so that everybody now gets going essentially. So, you know, I, I think the last couple of videos um, I watched were all about victims still trying to come forward and explaining what's being done to them. And I think from now on in 2017, we just have to move forward and, and talk about what we're going to do about it concretely, how we're going to collect evidence and that's actually great. move forward. So that people, first of all, people need hope. I mean, that's one thing. And, and also they, this program has to be shut down. I, it, it just can't continue, now it's public. And it's not like we don't know who's doing it, you know. Right. That's what really gets me. That's right, just hello and welcome to the World Beyond Belief. My name is Paul Marco. And today we have a very, very special guest. With us on Skype is Catherine Horton. Now, you know we're going to be talking about gang stalking, and a lot of you people who are schooled in gang stalking and what's going on probably know about Catherine already. She's an outspoken, she's a targeted individual herself, and she's an outspoken individual about doing something about the gang stalking problem not just talk and exploring what's going on, but actually doing something. She's designated 2017 as our year to get into action and throw this monkey off of our back. So very warm welcome to uh, the World Beyond Belief. Welcome to Catherine, Dr. Catherine. Hello, Hall. thank you so much for having me. Uh, would you like to give us a little background and then get us started and uh, what's going on with you and where you are? Sure. Um, so my background is I, um, I, I did my, um, my undergraduate degree at Oxford and I did a, a PhD after that and after, after that I became a research fellow. And um, my targeting actually began when I changed fields. Um, I, I was originally a particle physicist. So I was um, working at the big accelerator sites, one called DAISY in, in the north of um, Germany in Hamburg and another one which is very famous which is CERN. And I was a physicist at CERN, and um, then what I well, it was actually the um, the financial crisis that made me change fields because around me I just saw so many people just lose their homes, lose their jobs, and I, I just didn't understand what had happened in the world. And this was the biggest calamity I've I'd seen since the collapse of the um, of the communist East, essentially, and. Um, so my actually childhood background is that my parents and I, I was born in, in Transylvania, which is part of Romania, but we're Hungarians and Germans. And we essentially saw communist Romania collapse around us. And we fled to Germany. We've got German ancestors. And once we arrived in Germany, we were recognized as, as citizens, essentially. And um, so I grew up in Germany and I did my school career there. But um, essentially what I've seen in, in, in this collapsed state in Romania really, um, well, it stayed with me. So when the financial crisis hit, I thought, I literally thought, oh, I have seen this movie before. You know, this this complete calamity, um, just devastation of countries. And back when the financial crisis happened, I could have never foreseen it would just go on and on, you know, and other countries would be imploded as well. So what I decided to do is um, I thought, well, if I stay a particle physicist, I won't be able to help anybody, really. And, um, you know, people have these ideas about CERN, and the truth is actually a lot more boring. You know, people always say, are you going to create a black hole? And I always say, well, we have, but it's in the pension fund, you know. So <laughs> that's the truth. Um, so then I decided to study human systems, um, and I wanted to find out how to prevent collapses like that and also the, the incredible amount of fraud that went with it. So how to build resilient systems. And I, I picked a case, my first case study was the English legal system and I attended a court hearing, a high court hearing that was in the papers and very famous. And I started being targeted in the first week. And I started being followed home demonstratively from the court case. Um, at first I didn't know who was doing it, but very quickly it became clear that it must be just British intelligence. 
And um, at first I thought, oh, they are just doing their job in inverted commas. And I just let them you know, do whatever they were doing. But it became very demonstrative. So I had a, a man wait outside my drive every morning when I would go to the court. And they, the first day he would demonstratively follow me all the way to the train station, the next day just to the end of the street, and someone would be waiting there and take over. So essentially what I saw was the entire gang stalking system played out in front of my eyes, almost like a slow motion pantomime. And um, it, it, they did it very, very overtly. And um, the problem was this stalking never stopped. Um, it turned into overt street theatre, harassment, disconcerting theme, scenes, eventually a break-in into my home in Oxford. I, I came home and I discovered that my, my cupboard had been rearranged. And um, this is not something that you can go to the police with. You know, I mean, imagine I go to a police officer and say, you know, excuse me, officer, someone came in and rearranged my cupboard. So, um, but that's what I call a Stasi-style break-in. You know, the, the point is not to take valuables, the point is to disconcert you and leave you in this humiliated state whereby something has done has seriously infringed on your rights, but you cannot come forward. And essentially that pattern stayed with me and the offenses just became harder and harder and harder. And it was almost like the system testing what they can do with you. And because I was, I would say in retrospect, too stupid to, to kick up a fuss straight away, it just became ever more extreme. Um, so it started following me um, abroad. Eventually, it followed me to Germany on my house moves, and I was. Um, it had followed me abroad now to so many countries. I've now been stalked and also um, assaulted in I think five European countries in total. And um, actually, um, for those of your listeners who, who know the or know about gang stalking, it um, the situation in Europe almost one-to-one -one mirrors the one in the US, with the difference that, I think, for example, Eric Karlstrom t talks about the fact that he was stalked and harassed according, uh, across state boundaries. Yeah. Well, here in Europe, we're stalked and harassed according, uh, across country boundaries, but it's exactly the same. Um, and I very quickly realized that, just as, as Eric said, there's an assault protocol that travels with you, and wherever you go, Essentially, the, what we call the gang stalkers, they, as far as I can tell, are just the national surveillance network. They are the um, informants and, and street surveillance um, people. And um, bit by bit, I figured out how this whole system works. For example, a lot of the victims um, say, oh, they are harassing me with colors. So one day they would all be dressed in red and things like that. I think the people misunderstand. What they're actually doing is that they're picking up on the color coding that these, um, the surveillance network uses itself to identify the stalkers they have to pass the uh, surveillance chain um, to. You know, you've got a chain of people following you. And um, so what happened with me is that I watched this, this stalking network as a scientist. I was trying to um, identify what was happening to me. But in Germany, I started being um, actually hit with um, directed energy weapons. And um, I was, I think, assaulted twice without knowing what they are. And they forced me to so one time, they, I, they literally um, irradiated my heart. And I had these, these heart pains that were just mysterious. And they forced me to go to a doctor who then, of course, sends you to a cardiologist. And um, the interesting um, aspect was that the day I had the appointment, the heart problem disappeared. And then at the doctor's, uh, my blood sample would be stolen in a really demonstrative fashion. And... Essentially, it just became, you know, my medical care was infiltrated. Eventually, I was also radiated demonstratively by, a, by an unmarked helicopter with very high intensity um, electromagnetic waves. And um, that day, I was just standing on, on my rooftop terrace in my own home. And suddenly, this helicopter stopped above my head fairly close. And suddenly, I started feeling these intense waves traveling essentially through my um, cheeks and my chest and my legs. And it very much felt like, um, I'm not sure if you, you know, I would explain it to your listeners, like you're in a swimming pool and underwater you're standing next to the high pressure water jets and you can feel the pressure waves. Well, that's what it felt like. And I looked up and I realized that there's actually a glass roof between me and the helicopter. So it wasn't air pressure waves. This, this was really an electromagnetic attack. And they must have tested, a, I think they're called crowd control weapons. Um, they must have tested that on me. But it was bizarre. It was really bizarre. And as a victim, one is always in a mix of shock and incredulity. So I, for a long time, I didn't speak up. Um, 
And then when I eventually tried to approach lawyers, they told me, well, it sounds like you're being assaulted by the Secret Service and we have to tell you we can't do anything about the Secret Service in Germany. They're too powerful. So a lawyer actually said that to my face. There's nothing we can do. I mean, what outrageous criminality, you know? Um, by the time a society had re reached that point that a government organization cannot be stopped, whatever they do, then there's serious trouble. Um, and then I didn't speak up in Germany and we moved to Switzerland and in Switzerland um, just over Christmas from 2015, Christmas 2000, oh sorry, 2014, no forgive me, 2015, we came back 2016 last year and I discovered there had been another break in into our home in Switzerland and this time again small items disappeared quite demonstratively and there was a piece of jewelry on our windowsill which was clearly not mine and just again, little harassing things, but it was clear that someone had been here. And then I said to my husband, right, I had enough. I now had four years of harassment. I'm going to report it to the police. And half an hour later, I was for the first time openly assaulted with microwave weapons. And in that instance, first I, we went to bed and I was lying in bed and suddenly my foot was burned. And it was this odd sensation of actual intense burning and suddenly the sensation crawled up my leg and hit my knee and then it turned into intense joint ache. But what was so bizarre is as soon as I reached down um, you know, about, um, and reached into the beam, the pain transferred from my um, knee onto the back of my hand and suddenly I had this intense ache in the knuckles. And that was so odd, I put my other hand on top and again the pain transferred into the knuckles of my left hand. So suddenly I felt, oh, there's something, a, 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 like, a, like a burning ray into our, our um, bedroom. And I kind of mapped out the beam before it was switched off. But essentially mapping it out, I burned my hand. So for several days I just had this deep burning sensation. Um, where they had burned my foot and, and where I burned myself, my hands, just waving it around. Um, and it was just bizarre and there were no traces on the skin um, and that's when I started to research systematically and uh, but that's also the day when they started assaulting me non-stop and um, ever since I've just been just shot into with high intensity beams um, I managed to figure out just from always putting my hand above the aching area and they would shoot through my knuckles essentially. And from the pain I could, I could figure out where the angle was where the beams were coming from and I discovered that there were three or four properties around the house from where they were shooting into me. And um, eventually I tried to um, do the usual steps of reporting it to the police, the police just ignored me. Right. And you know, that's, I think, a common um, experience. Uh, I think they reported me to mental health as a kind of like a warning right. and, and so on. Um, and then eventually, then when it became really wild, that's when I tried, because my targeting started in England, I went back to um, the, the courts in, in, in the UK. And at first I used um, the proper procedure. I, um, there's a, a secret court called the Investigatory Powers Tribunal, which is specifically for the intelligence agencies. And um, citizens can com um, submit a complaint to that court. Uh, but it's what I personally would call a kangaroo court. So it's very odd. Um, and one doesn't get to know if, if, if the complaint is rejected, one doesn't hear why. There's no judge really deciding it, or at least I didn't hear about the judge. It's very mysterious. Um, and essentially, um, I think the vast majority of their cases, they just reject as frivolous and vexatious. And that's clear from their own statistics on their, on their website. So, and, but th what was interesting is that I submitted a complaint in a real rush because I was, I was assaulted so bad, I, I thought I, I can't cope. I, I basically had shots fired into my head painfully every couple of minutes and um, it's uh, totally surreal. Um, and I submitted a complaint to the UK, this tribunal, and at the same time I sent an email to cease and desist to the German intelligence service, who I also knew had insulted me. And, and then um, what these people did is, in the most demonstrative fashion, just assault me even harder. And just a day after that, I flew to Spain for a family um, meetup. And on the flight, um, the back of my head was irradiated painfully. So suddenly I was burning on the scalp and an intense headache. And as this was happening, and I put my hand on the back of my head, a young guy behind me said, pain on the back of the head, really loud in German. 
And I turned around, and as soon as I turned around, he quickly put something away. So from that experience, I would assume that they have little handheld emitters that emit this um, intense microwave radiation. And um, it was unbelievable. So that was the incident, incident on the plane. Then um, in Spain itself, I had my hip irradiated. I, I emailed back to German intelligence and I said, well, because this guy spoke German, I said, how come? I ask you to cease and desist and I'm assaulted. And then in response to that email, I had essentially my hip damaged. So they kept shooting into my hip in public and at night from essentially a public bar below. And um, these microwaves essentially pass through normal building material, I think at 50% or higher. So essentially using these microwave emitters, and if you aim it at a wall, it's almost like shooting a laser pointer through milky glass. And these weapons allow people to, to mutilate um, others inside their own home and behind walls. It is surreal. Um, and it just went from there. So, you know, it, that's already psychopathic enough. Um, and after this weekend um, in Spain, I flew back on the flight back that the young man who I believe has assaulted me was again sitting in the row behind us and in the queue to the um, to security and to, the, um, to boarding. He was next to me. He was putting on street theater. And then to top it all off on the flight back, um, the person sitting next to me just knocked my leg and I turned around and I looked at her. And as I looked at her, she was looking down on her mobile phone. And as I glanced at her mobile phone, I saw that she had a photograph of my father in an airplane cabin wearing exactly the clothes that he had worn when he came out to that weekend. So German intelligence literally, in reply to my email, had photographed my father and then used it in this harassment theater. I mean, it's absolutely unbelievable. You know, it's, um, it's, it's, it, I cannot put across just what, in what staggering criminality they, these people are caught up in. It's just unbelievable. So after that incident, I thought, right, that's it. I, I have to do something about it. And I traveled to the um, UK High Court and I thought, let's forget about this tribunal. And I wanted to ask the High Court for um, an emergency injunction, essentially. And on the way there to the high court, essentially from the airport to my hotel, um, a chap just started talking to me and suddenly out of the blue, he said, um, well, there's criminality in every country, but in some countries it's just very well hidden. And he repeated that sentence twice, which was already odd. And then there was a pause. And then he said to me, did they kill Diana? And and so princess, that's princess Diana who died in a car crash, in a high speed car crash. And I just said, I don't know, I mean, who are they, you know, what, what is this about? And that, you know, I had been harassed and I thought, oh, this is probably just some stupid harassment theater. But that essentially turned out to be a death threat because the next day I went to the high court. Um, I appeared before a judge. He said, um, he said to me, listen, we have to do this on notice. So we have to notify the other parties. So we have to notify the intelligence agencies. I cannot grant you an injunction like that. And he adjourned, and I returned to my hotel room, and then that's already incredible. So I had appeared as a litigant in an ongoing high court case. I returned to my hotel room, and in my hotel room, I was shot into the back of the head with um, pulsed microwave guns. And that felt like, um, well, it's, I can only describe it like having nails, large nails shot into the back of the head with, a, with an industrial nail gun. That's what it felt like. And as I put my hand on it, I felt just again, um, you know, pain race punching through my hand, essentially. And they fired like something like a dozen or two dozen shots into the back of my hand, a head until I collapsed from pain. Um, I imagine, I mean, this is just like, I, I always say, isn't this a world premiere that the, the intelligence agencies have reached a level of criminality where if you appear in a high court case against them, they will just assault you. And what was incredible is that um, I, I always carry rolls of aluminium with me because I find that it actually does help. And um, I was there and I, I made essentially head protection from several layers of entry when I recovered. And I curled up and I was just waiting for my husband to return. And when he came back, I jumped up and I was trying to tell him what had happened. And they started firing again. So they literally assaulted me in front of my husband. So I collapsed on the full floor crying from pain again. And 
it, that was already unbelievable. But then when we returned to um, Switzerland, which was exactly three days after this death threat, um, I was shot um, in the face and, and in the eye and the forehead driving our car on the motorway inside a tunnel um, here in Switzerland. So we were doing over, I think, 120 kilometers per hour, over 100 kilometers per hour. And um, suddenly I felt these, these shots being fired. And it's, um, it's very hard to describe what it feels like. I mean, it's not just intense pain. You, you suddenly have blurry vision. And you, it's, you also don't think straight because you essentially have just high energetically, you know, high energy electromagnetic pulses pulsing your brain. And um, I thought, oh, my God, I'm, I'm going to lose orientation. And um, I said to my husband, I have to get out of the beam. So I just swerved into the other lane. And as soon as I was out of this um, line between the car behind me and um, in front of me, the pain stopped. But I would say one second later, and I would have just crashed into the side of the tunnel. And so I consider that to be a, a proper assassination attempt. Um, and it just went from there. So, <laughs> you know, I, I just received again harder attacks. I had to flee my home for two weeks because the attacks were so hard um, after this um, assassination attempt. And, um, you know, I, I came back. I had two weeks to prepare that for the second um, hearing, which just wasn't enough. So I asked for time extension, which was granted. And with that time extension, I had six weeks left to prepare this my court case you know, um, reverse engineer the technology, find documentation, find other victims and so on. And I managed to put together a file. Um, but essentially, I, there just wasn't enough time to do all that whilst also being shot at. And, and in that phase, they, what they did on me is what I call brain interference. So that was for the very first time. I wasn't just directly shot painfully um, into my body, but... They did something which now, in, um, in retrospect, I would say was um, essentially these fancy brain interference technologies where they irradiate your head with electromagnetic radiation and they can con confuse you, um, give you um, extreme emotions and essentially um, paralyze you, neurologically paralyze you. And I experienced um, for the very first time that and they did that extremely intensely in those six weeks. So eventually, I mean, with the attacks and, and of course, nonstop harassment outside and, and hacking. Oh, yes, my email inbox was taken offline for two weeks with crucial emails and in extreme sabotage. And then I returned to the high court for the third hearing and I asked for a second time extension. And there my, my court case was essentially terminated even though the judge knew I had survived an assassination attempt, even though he knew I had been shot in the head um, after my first hearing, he still terminated it. And I think, I, I can't remember the exact wording in the transcript, but he said, well, the investigatory past tribunal, the secret court said, it's probably frivolous or vexatious, your case. And I tend to agree if that's the sort of evidence you have. I mean, it was outrageous. But the key thing about that high court case was that because I, I, I couldn't find a lawyer willing to represent me, and not even the what's called the bar pro bono unit um, in the UK, um, which is essentially the last resort sort of um, association, even they were not willing to take this case. Um, and I had prepared everything myself. And because I'm not a lawyer, I didn't know that at least on one document I need to write particulars of claim. I was still just trying to um, argue for a time extension. And then what they did is they said there's not even a claim to strike out because at, at no point did you write particulars of claim. So you, you don't have a claim. So what they say, what they said is that they um, either declined my application or something like that. So that, that's, I think, a legal just gray zone. I mean, it just means get lost, please just go away. Um, and then it was even worse. I discovered that they had mo modified the transcripts. Um, they had taken questions by the judge out. They had um, scrubbed my answer. Um, and those were pretty, um, pretty crucial parts. Um, and, and then they were not willing to actually... I think the same thing happened to, um, to Charles Seven, actually. So I, from her, 
I, I, or from what I know about her case online, I knew that she requested the, um, the audio recording for her, her court cases because she had the same experience at the Royal Courts of Justice. But in my case, they just declined to even answer this email, answer my request. Right. So they refused to give out the audio recordings or refused to deal with my case. They also refused to put the judgment up online. I asked, I said, why does it not appear in the online search? And they refused to reply to that. So it's, um, you know, it's incredible. And that was, um, that was in the summer. And then I thought, right, I'll see, maybe they stop. You, you know, maybe it's the, the British establishment's way of brushing it under the carpet and they just want me to go away. And so I did go away, but instead of just stopping, they just assaulted me ever harder and harder. So they chased me to, my husband and I went for a weekend to Italy to try to escape the assaults here in our Swiss home. They tracked us all the way to Italy. Um, they demonstrated, we arrived at 1 a.m. at night, checked in and they demonstrated we stalked us all the way checked in after us and then ended up next door and irradiated us from next door in the hotel room. And, and then we fled Italy. We went back to Germany to my parents. We were chased and I was irradiated all the way. So from, from a long car drive from North Italy all the way to, to Germany. And it's essentially the experience is that this entire system has gone utterly out of control. It, it literally is just out of control. These, these people have been operating with impunity for so long. They don't even know what it's like to just stop or to just obey the, the rule of law or anything. Um, so my experience has been horrific, but still not as horrific as what many, many victims went through who, who had this experience over 40 years or more. Um, you know, I mean, um, what, what I did then is I tried to, kind of stay quiet for a couple of months, hoping they will stop eventually, but they didn't. It just became ever more extreme. And eventually, I didn't see any other way but to go public. So I, the very first time I went public was on the um, Richie Allen show, which is online. Um, and then for that, I hastily made a, a, a Twitter page and a website very quickly. I put everything up. Um, and then I started making YouTube videos, essentially. Um, and that was I actually... Um, Richie Allen was the very first person to respond and actually um, interview me or give me any sort of attention. Um, I had um, emailed and I had um, tweeted at all the major media outlets. I mean, with a story like that, you know, I think I must be the, perhaps not the first person in the history of the English courts, but certainly in the 21st century or even the 20th century, the first litigant in a high court case to be shot in the head by the respondents straight after the first right. hearing. I mean, that is something to report about, right. you know. But they refused, and they refused to report any other aspect of my case. Um, so I have, I have literally seen this, this media collusion um, close up. But um, after all this, what I still wasn't I prepared for emotionally is to, to find out just how many people there are who are being targeted. I still thought, oh, maybe there are a couple of hundred. Um, and I heard that some people said, oh, there might be a few thousand. But as soon as I went public, I, I mean, the, um, the number of responses I got from victims who, and, and horrific stories who said, um, I, I, I got, for example, one from a single mother and she said, well, the same thing is happening to me. I have an autistic child and we are being targeted. And I, I, I just really, I just, I can't even cope listening to that because, I mean, what, what insanity, what bottomless evil are people capable of? I mean, anybody who has an autistic child knows how hard life is already. You know, and, and then being a single mother, and then on, on top of that, the intelligence agencies have the arrogance to think they can just take a person like that and assault them in essentially a death camp experiment, because this is what these things are. You know, they are, um, I mean, first of all, they are, they are essentially programs when you shoot into people's bodies with microwave weapons, these are cancer weapons. They cause organ damage and, and many other things. These weapons are not known. We know who the arms manufacturers are. But um, the next level up is when they start doing brain mapping exercises and try to start to move your muscles remotely, which they've done since then to me. 
And, and those experiments are quite specifically the follow-on from the death camp experiments. So, um, you know, when you put it all together, I, I came to the conclusion there's no other way but to accuse the intelligence agencies of crimes against humanity, essentially. And this is what I started doing in my videos. Um, because, I mean, I went through this phase when I first um, went public of just trying desperately to tell people about this tell my colleagues about it, tell everybody. And I've, I've written to all my past colleagues, um, you know, at CERN, or everybody I knew at CERN, at DAISY, this other research site, at the um, two Oxford colleges where I had studied and where I had worked myself. And um, I was really busy trying to just tell people what's happening. And then I realized how much material and how many victims are already online. And then I realized, no, we're past the point where we have to tell people that, you know, the, about the horrific injuries and what's happening to us. We're done. Now we should all just get together and think about what are we going to do about it? Because what's clear is that these people have not stopped for decades. And there seems to be this acceleration in this out of control system whereby they are assaulting ever more people, ever more brutally, ever more insanely, and, and they can't seem to stop. I mean, by the time you've reached already this thing with the high court, that's already enough. But by the time I've now put out four public appeals that are on YouTube to both um, the heads, directly to the heads of um, British intelligence and German intelligence, describing in detail what has happened to me, and they still cannot bring themselves to stop. I mean, today I was tortured again. I was shot into. I had insane headaches. They moved my hand remotely again. I wake up with bruises and you think, what needs to happen, you know, at what point of criminality? I mean, it's, it's, um, I don't know how to describe it. I, it's, um, I, you know, when you read the news carefully or, you know, you put together all the declassified documents, we know that a lot of the intelligence agencies have been doing drug running and in the UK they've been involved with pedophilia. That's already in the public domain. But in the past, it has always been hidden, you know. So, but now the stage of, you know, the, of utter degeneracy that they've reached is that they continue maiming and murdering in public. So what they're essentially doing is public mutilation and public executions. It's unbelievable. And um, I think the, um, the big wake-up call for the world um, should have been the, the essentially the public execution so that she was murdered, the, the, the murder of um, the ex-Finnish um, chief medical officer, um, Dr. Ronnie Kilder. She died in February 2015 and she was um, quite spectacularly murdered with electromagnetic weapons, as I understand. Um, she was alive long enough to tell her friends what had happened to her. She was taken to hospital where she was abused. She was allergic to morphine, yet she was injected twice with morphine, became very, very ill. Um, her kidney was punched into with one of, by one of the doctors so that, you know, she started passing blood. It was, it was horrific. It was like, it was like straight, some, something straight out of the Gestapo times, essentially. And, and then she died. Um, but, but essentially what set off this, this process was her being brutally assaulted with high um, energy directed energy weapons you know and um, what so if we now you know look at that case we have to say what the intelligence agencies did in her case is a public execution and that was 2015 and now they essentially after all these victims are public on Twitter on YouTube they continue mutilating them publicly and in Germany and also in the UK, I know about two cases where even though they were public, they were still murdered. So there's the case of Darim Daoud in the UK, who, um, who essentially was found dead um, after he um, went public. And there's still a YouTube video of him where he shows the microwave burns under his eyes. Um, and the other case in, in Germany, I mean, in Germany, a lot of people died. I have known to have died, but there's one case um, of... Um, her name was um, Britta Lea Jacquard. She was a Swiss citizen who, as far as I can tell, was essentially tortured to death in Germany by German intelligence. And her blog is still up. So you can, you can see, and she's talking about her, about her injuries and about what these um, assaults did to her eye. 
how she became jaundiced when they, I, I presume, must have shot her liver to pieces bit by bit. It, it's, it's so horrific. I can't explain it. And it's, it's there for everybody to see, you know? Um, so, gosh, so this is the situation we're dealing with. We essentially have the intelligence agency so out of control. They are now, personally, I would say what I personally call the Gestapo mode. You know, they have reached essentially the depravity of the Gestapo. They are publicly assaulting people in their own homes. They are publicly mutilating and they're destroying lives. Um, so I think that's now a wake up call. And for this reason, I essentially said 2017, that must be the year we all go public. And from now on, we just talk about what are we going to do about this? How are we going to stop them? You know, so, so that's basically, sorry, I quite, I went on quite a, quite a bit about this. Um, so um, this is essentially my story and what happened to me. And um, now I'm just, um, you know, all about what are we going to do trying to link up with people, essentially. I think, I think we have the intelligence agencies no doubt out of control. And it shows up in gang stalking, shows up in child trafficking now. They seem to be above the law. I know we covered the Hampstead cover-up, and they could get no... The, the, the English court system was totally useless, and yeah. uh, they threw them out. I think uh, Charlie Seven won her case, but it was a tort case. They call them a tort case in, in the U.S. Mm, yeah. financial. And so she sued them for a lot of money, but the courts never took any action. She couldn't move forward. She has no money. So yeah. they've treated her like that. Also, I think it's important that you don't think that these, the CIA, the M MI5, and the other intelligence agencies are out after bad guys. They're yeah. not. 70%, according to your website, 70% of the targeted individuals are women, probably women and children, if I know the CIA and the MI5. And I fight. So it's not about that. And we're in the apocalypse, which is the unveiling. And this is the unveiling. So as the unveiling happens, we take action. It's the only way we can do it. I don't think there's any place we can go to. You said you can't go to the lawyers, you can't go to the police. You, you know that all uh, law enforcement agencies are, <clears throat> are part of their uh, contract is to pursue crimes against humanity wherever they find it. And I've never mm -hmm. seen any of them take any, any initiative in any of this stuff. I mean, even yeah. when the CIA was admittedly torturing people, that's a crime against humanity. Nothing was yeah. ever done. So, mm -hmm. so I'm anxious. I'm sitting here. What are we going to do about this now, Catherine, uh, coming into 2017? What's your, what are your, some of your ideas, and what do you think? So. I, I think, and it basically comes back to what I said in the beginning, I have seen this movie before, because what happened in communist Romania was essentially, um, I, I also made a, for, for those listeners who are interested, I made a video trying to use systems analysis to explain how a pyramid organization gets captured naturally. So you end up cap with capture through corrupt elements or even capture from psychopaths. Essentially, psychopaths always try to climb up the ranks. The, the only drive they have is more power, more control. Um, so if you have a large pyramid organization, and most organigrams are essentially this you know, pyramid right. structure, you have essentially these psychopaths, as soon as they um, enter an organization, climbing up the ranks. And you, if you have a big enough organization, the entire upper echelon, after a while, will be just psychopaths. So this could take maybe a few decades, but with the organizations we have, um, you know, the, the upper echelons of the intelligence agencies for sure, because they are ancient, but on many other organizations, what people observed across the board, I mean, this applies to the World Bank, you know, this applies to the IMF, this applies to the intelligence agencies, that bit by bit it became ever more criminal, ever more um, corrupt, um, and, and eventually just ever more psychopathic. And it seems to be happening simultaneously and of course they are you know they are also um, well uh, mechanisms through which you know if you have um, large corruption um, 
or extensive um, rampant corruption in the in the banking industry well, where you've got all the money they can use the money to corrupt other systems and maybe if they're involved in drugs you know because drugs are so profitable as an investment yeah. well if you want to protect your investment you should infiltrate the intelligence agencies because then you can protect your drug running and I think this is what happened essentially in every country and so what I am trying to do now is I'm trying to think like a scientist and say um, you know what people, what we're seeing now is, is horrific because it's on this global scale and it's happening all at the same time. That's why we can't go to a country where we can escape this. But at the same time, it's also something, a process we know because this sort of process of capture happens everywhere in all organizations. You know, even in small companies, you get some corrupt person at the top and the company goes down. And now we have this situation. So if we look at it from that point of view, there are definite things we can do to recapture the organization because it's not just psychopaths who can climb to the top. We can climb to the top too. But what we have to do is now do exactly what the psychopaths did and capture. So we have to recapture the organization. And another thing I was trying to make clear in my, in my videos, so this is my personal view right. um, about what to do. I think we need to recapture. And the second thing to keep in mind is that not everybody who is at the moment following corrupt orders is corrupt themselves. There are many psychological effects that make people um, fearful, make people obey orders. One of them is, for example, the, um, the Milgram effect, which is, you know, after... Um, Stanley Milgram, who had the Milgram experiment and could prove that um, people are even willing to follow, if, as long as it comes from a figure of authority, they're willing to follow orders that seriously harm another person and potentially even cause death, just because they're so fearful of authority. Um, now, that's also a psychological effect that plays into this. Um, so, at the moment, the situation looks looks like we're just faced with entirely corrupt organizations and there's nothing we can do. But as soon as we start recapturing, um, we will discover that people will flip sides and flip back into being um, decent again when you um, apply a little bit of pressure to them. And what's interesting is that unless they're psychopaths, you don't even have to apply that much pressure. So what I started doing, um, and, and I encourage everybody who is concerned about this to join in and also bring in their own personal ideas of how to do this, I started just publicly um, stating who the culprits are, in my view, and public. So first of all, make it public, and then start applying pressure. So I, for example, made public that in my case, I think I, I, I can say fairly certainly that in my case I'm being targeted by British intelligence and German intelligence. And there's also sufficient documentation about the fact that they work so closely together, they're almost one big organization, you know, these intelligence agencies. But in my case, it's essentially the German and the British branch of this big, you know, conglomerate. And um, I am just addressing the heads of those organizations publicly and I now, just the past week, I put out four public appeals for them to cease and desist and I will continue describing every day what happens to me and repeat, ask them to cease and desist. And I also made public that um, the German ambassador to Switzerland refused to help me for um, now almost a year. Um, I made that public. I also um, asked um, high-profile whistleblowers to write to him and ask for him to assist me. Um, now, as it, as it stands, he still refuses to even grant me a meeting. Um, and his, his assistant, who, with whom I spoke just before Christmas, also refuses to essentially respond to me. So they essentially are still on the stage where they just go, la, 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 we don't hear anything, we're not going to respond. But um, that cannot last. It's not public. I mean... If this guy doesn't help me, it will stay with, as, a, as a blemish on his career forever. And I think these people don't understand social media and how information just sticks. So I would say to all victims um, that we have huge power. For the very first time in our life, we actually have huge power. Because if you look at history, um, when, when our systems became extremely psychopathic like they're now, that was, for example, in the Second World War when the Gestapo essentially started rounding up people. Also in the communist times when essentially the secret services in communist countries did the same. And we had communism and the, the horrific number of deaths and so on. But in those days, we didn't have these, um, this interconnectedness and this level of communication. So this is the only thing that's different. And this is actually a hugely powerful tool because of um, essentially networks and their very specific mathematics. 
To put it simply, networks are the most nonlinear thing that we know. So, nonlinear means that it has an amplification effect that just shoots up. So, in a sense, a nonlinear process is, for example, the chain reaction in a, in a nuclear bomb. You know, it's like one microsecond, everything's fine, and a microsecond later, an entire city has been wiped. I mean, that's quite, that is a nonlinear process. But the same thing also applies to networks. And we, if we want to stop this, we have to use network effects. This kind of intermeshing between us. And um, a network effect is, for example, this, um, that um, people discovered that the number of links between us all are something like six, six degrees of freedom. And I think with Facebook, it's now three degrees of freedom. So I can reach any person in the world through Facebook by just asking two people to just, you know, forward my message until it reaches this person. And I think we have to use that because I think our systems are captured by criminals, captured by psychopaths and captured by corrupt people. But the number of these people who are seriously disturbed is far too small for them to control everything. They are counterbalanced by a much larger number of people who are mostly decent, maybe just cowed, maybe just you know enticed to do corrupt things without knowing what they're doing. And we can turn this entire system around very rapidly as long as we essentially send the system broadcast that we're now stopping this corruption. That's it, we're stopping this now. We're naming the problem and we're saying, that's it, we're now moving, moving up against it. And I think it is through the system broadcast that we can essentially achieve what I call the system cycle. So go back to the rule of law. Concretely how to do this, this sounds very abstract. So this is concretely how to do it. I think what we need to do is um, start essentially sending these messages that this is what's happening to victims. Um, also say, you know, that this is now pretty clear that it's coming from essentially using military equipment, using the um, surveillance networks of the intelligence agencies. We know who the culprits are and we want this stopped. And we now have to pass this message to essentially all key figures in our society. We have to remember that essentially our society is made up of the professionals. And um, most of them are very, very good people, you know, are very hardworking, otherwise they wouldn't have gotten to where they are. So I started with this. I first notified all the high energy physicists I know, all the academics I know. Um, last week I put out a notification to all the high, um, all the Supreme Court judges in the United Kingdom. I just wrote to them and I said, this is the situation, this is what's happening. And I said, please use your channels, your private network to help us shut this down. And I think this is what we have to do, in my personal opinion. So we have to reach out to people and and instead of just reaching out and creating awareness, as it were, so far, which is what um, I think we've been doing so far, we now have to reach out and actually have a call to action. And we have to say what specifically they should do. And I think at the moment what they can do is um, make phone calls, tell everybody and ask whatever professional they, they know to take definite action to have this stopped, whatever is in their means. You know, I mean, in a sense, if we, if we send a call like that, within, I think, within one day, we could reach qualified engineers who can help us, you know, find the sources. We can find qualified doctors who can tell us how to, you know, pin down the injuries we, um, we sustain and so on. And we can certainly find qualified lawyers to help us argue the case. And also we can reach all the judges so that they, are, they understand how crucial it is that we stop this. Because I believe if we don't stop this, we essentially have an entire rerun of, of the Second World War, basically. We now have essentially the global intelligence conglomerate doing what the Gestapo did just in Germany. And we know already with the Gestapo, that was essentially just affecting one country in the beginning. Um, it took a world war to stop it. So now imagine when, when it's done on a global scale, what will it take to stop this? You know, So it's kind of like a... 2017 is a now or never, basically, right. as far as I'm concerned. For so many things that are going on, uh, it is a now or never. Now, I've worked in organizations all my life as an organizational psychologist. And to my thinking, pyramidal organizations are a power, they're a psychopath magnet. Yeah. They'll do anything yeah. they can to get to the top. And uh, the, the, the organizations that we're dealing with now, like the CIA, which started as the ISS, 
which Aleister Crowley was involved in starting. I mean, you have bad guys right from the beginning. You have uh, Michael Aquino was involved, Alan, Alan Dulles. You have really horrible psychopaths right from the beginning in these organizations. So they're definitely psychopathic. But the one thing I found working in organizations, uh, the, the pyramidal structure is powerful, but it's not as powerful as the flat organization of people. Uh, I spent uh, 10 years of my life changing pyramidal organizations into more team-based organizations. Wow, yeah. And uh, they could do things so much faster, so much cheaper. So it, actually, I, it probably sped up the move of industry out of the out of the U.S. to China, because we were getting so good at that, and so I want to I want to tell you that I know for a fact that individuals working with other individuals in a common core, a common cause. I mean, working together, uniting with one another, because we have to stop this. We have. Child trafficking is happening all over the world, and you can't get any response from the court system. The same as this, this uh, gang stalking. Gang stalking is much more worse, much worse than it would be in World War II, because in World War II, you don't have electric, electromagnetic uh, waves that can hit everybody on the planet at once. I mean, we are so outgunned as far as technology is concerned. It's amazing. But your approach, talking to individuals, making individuals responsible for what they're doing, following orders, then what's it called, the Nuremberg defense? It was no defense at all. Following orders or doing what you're told is, is no defense. You're responsible for what you do. If you're gang stalking somebody, you're responsible for that. If you're hitting on them on the back of the head, I just said it. If you're hitting somebody on the back of the head in an airplane, they're doing gang stalking, you're responsible. Not the guy that ordered you or the guy that ordered him. It's you that are responsible. And you have Absolutely. to realize that you're responsible. So I think that you're, I think it's divinely inspired your motivation to get people, just to write people. We have people write us now about gang stalking. Find out where it's coming from and go right back to what you're doing. Go back to what uh, Catherine's advising us to do. Communicate with them directly. Tell them you're responsible for killing me. You're doing this. Very good. Absolutely. It's, it's so interesting, actually, that you mentioned this, these flat hierarchies because you are so right. You're so right. At, at CERN, we used to work in this flat hierarchy. And I think, in a sense, what we're seeing now is essentially the self-assembly of exactly this flat hierarchy by just mobilizing the, the targeted individuals, so as I call them, the victims of the intelligence agencies, to actually start acting. You know, they make phone calls, they will figure out what to do, and we will figure out ourselves how to interface with the court system. And I think as we're slowly building up momentum, I think more and more professionals will join us. Because I was just thinking, there's so many private investigators, they must know who's organizing these, um, you know, they must know who even the handlers are. And yeah. I think after a while, we will have more and more professionals join in. And what I really wanted to kick off is essentially exactly what you described, this kind of decentralized flat hierarchy of people, of autonomous little um, groups, all working towards the same cause of having to shut down. And I think we'll find that once we start going up against the intelligence agencies, um, in a sense, they were the organization we were never allowed to talk about. Right. You know, I mean, we were happy talking about British Telecom and the, the health system and all other government departments, but not the intelligence agencies. Because as soon as you said, uh, you know, I've got a problem with the intelligence agencies, you were stamped as mad straight right. away. And this has been going on for now decades. So in a sense, what we're doing now is catching up with all the, you know, every, every system has scandals, but we, we were never allowed to actually work through the scandals in the intelligence agencies. We're never allowed to, to stop them. But I, I suspect that once we start moving against them, we will start solving several problems at the same time. Because I think, as you said, they are, 
I think, a key player in, in organizing and protecting the, the child prostitution rings. They must be, because there's no way they couldn't know what's going on. The same with the drugs, essentially most of the organized crime. You can't have large-scale organized crime and at the same time this high-tech secret service right. not knowing who is doing it, right. when and what. It's impossible. So, you know, I think what happened is that they got captured at some point and now we have this interwoven organized crime ring. Um, and I think that explains the criminality. For them, it's just business as usual, you know. I think, I think this is the sad truth, you know. I think, I think you're um, very, very, very true. I think we could be start, uh, start by taking pictures of these people that are stalking us and find a place on the web you can put them. There's a lot of uh, social media coming online. Uh, Vidme, uh, we can start uh, putting things on there. I know we published uh, names of the people who were named in the uh, Hampstead cover-up and they took our website down immediately. But there are ways to get around that now and there are ways to get that information out there. If you're doing this, you need to be responsible for, for what you're doing. They're just order followers. And uh, yeah. I, think, I think you're right. We need to spread out and we need to do this because you can't have a civilization run by these uh, psychopaths. It's just, yeah. it's just impossible. And I think, you know what, when, when my targeting happened, I went through the usual psychological cycle of thinking, oh, why me, and oh my God, what I'm going to do. And then I realized, hang on, it took this much for me to actually start acting, because wasn't it the case that in front of my eyes, people lost their home because of rampant fraud? You know, entire families were left destitute. Um, then in the UK, the entire health system is being dismantled. They even withdrew the um, the funding to disabled people to a large extent, so that thousands, as far as I know, thousands of them killed themselves out of desperation. And I didn't do anything. So it really took, you know, in my case, it, it, it took this much for me to right. even get going. And, and I think, well, maybe it's, it's for the better, you know, maybe it's for the better that it has become this bad because now we really will start acting and now we should solve several problems at the same time, you know. I mean, as we speak, um, there are not just people being shot at with microwave weapons, there are also children being abused and trafficked and, you know, and, and we, we need to solve all of those problems and I think we very quickly can if we recapture the intelligence agencies. In a sense, we have to go up to the intelligence agencies. For example, in the UK, I know for a fact that thousands of children are known to have disappeared. The question is, where are they? And who to ask? I mean, the intelligence agencies must know where they are. There's no way to disappear several thousand people in the UK without them knowing. It's impossible. And now I can say that for sure because I've seen their gang stalking right. networks, you know? Right. I know what they're capable of. So now there's no excuses, you know? In a sense, they have demonstrated their full capabilities on us victims. So it's now on us to turn around and say, okay, well, you're doing this to us, but what are you doing about the other problems, you know, and actually demand results. Exactly. Well, we started off at 9-11. <clears throat> I mean, that was a Mossad CIA in conjunction yeah. with the high levels of the government. That should have woken a lot of us up and got us on, on the bandwagon. Now it's getting worse and worse and worse. Um, everybody knows, I think a lot of people know people who are targeted. Certainly a lot of people know uh, children who are taken away from their family. That's rampant now uh, all over the place. And child trafficking. And thank God for things like uh, Pizzagate and, yeah. uh, and people like you that are bold enough to come out here and have something to say and a, and a way to get started on it. I think it's really... Uh, I really admire you and really think that, that I, you know, when you're targeted, uh, I think your first defense is to stop what you're doing. Whatever I'm doing, I'm going to stop, I'm going to hide, uh, just leave me alone, leave me alone. But, the, yeah. but they don't stop. As Eric no. told us last time, they don't stop. Once you start, you're in the database and they're going to gather information on you and they're going to torture you until they kill you. So there's yeah. no reason to stop. If, if you're in this program, come forward. Do what uh, Catherine's saying. Uh, get in touch with us. Get in touch with Catherine or myself. You can do it through the comments below. 
Um, Catherine has a great website called uh, stop007.org. Stop007.org. It's a great website, and it's not uh, one of these complicated websites you can find your way around. There's categories, simply stated, she, it's clear and transparent, and there's a way to contact her and to get involved in this. And I think this is how we can this is how we're going to start turning it around in 2017. Absolutely. And I, I would, um, if I just may, one of the things I would really encourage everybody who listens to this and is targeted, I think the way I would go about doing this, going public, is, is maybe I, I, the way I did it was actually very easy. I just opened a Twitter page. I started tweeting about what's happening. And this way you can bit by bit put out information and see what you're comfortable with. And I think a lot of the people aren't, comfortable straight away to make a video. I really think the best way is to start making videos because people respond to our faces, to our appearances, and people, as soon as they listen to you, they know you're genuine. But I would say to this to people, please make a Twitter page, tweet at me, tweet what's happening to you, I will retweet, and let's just spread this information. In a sense, if you really want to help us, you can already just retweet. Post, repost, everything we say, amplify our message. So it's actually really easy to have um, a hugely powerful impact. It's easier than we think, thanks to modern technology. Right. We do. We have modern technology also. We have videotapes. We have cameras. Uh, have you come upon things that help you uh, divert some of this energy weapons? I mean, you said aluminum foil. Yeah, so um, actually I think there are two forms of attack um, I experienced. There's um, certainly, I mean, from the bruises I, I have woken up with and from the experience I have had, I can say in my case, they are shooting into me with um, what to me looks like pencil beams. So that's roughly the size of a coin. It's extremely painful. It burns or can give you joint ache in a very limited area. And then what really helps is just wrapping several layers of essentially baking for aluminum foil around it because it's metal and it reflects it. I also discovered that sometimes they shoot into my body very deeply. And um, at first I didn't understand how do they do that with just a beam? How, where can they tell where exactly along the beam does the pain occur? And then I figured out that they're using two beams that they overcross and I'll feel the pain where the beams overcross and I get double the energy essentially. And when they're shooting, for example, they shot into my lungs and my back and by waving my hands around once by accident I discovered that there are two beams going into me and then I discovered um, so when they shot into my chest and so on in my stomach I had to wrap myself entirely in aluminium two or three times around uh -huh. and that really stopped the attack so um, a lot of the victims had heart attacks induced and things like that I think there are different ways they can do that. Um, I think one of them is directly shoot into your heart. Um, well, you can, you can protect yourself from that by, um, by having aluminium around you, but it's not enough to have it just in front because they can shoot through your back essentially as well. So it's all these things I have figured out bit by bit. But I think with heart attacks, they might be able to also um, affect your brain and the, the, the signals. So that's a bit more difficult. But any sort of metal, lead also helps, um, and it very much depends on the attack. People say that ice packs also help. If they are, for example, if they're just burning you, then the ice packs absorb the energy, so the ice melts, but it doesn't actually reach your body. That uh, also helps. Um, and then, but there's one, when they start doing brain interference, that's actually very hard to block out, um, just because it's almost like a mobile phone signal, it seems to be the case. Um, so it very much depends, but otherwise metal is a good idea. Um, and I think that is, so far that's the, the greatest insight I could find, is that it's not just metal, you have to sometimes block it out because they can shoot from another direction. And it's so scary to actually realize that these beams pass totally through our bodies. Um, it's, it's, gosh, I mean it's like an entire, you know, horror show in itself, but this is it, metal essentially, that's what stops it. Uh, so. Uh I think we need scientists to step forward, scientists like yourself who've studied this and know about directed energy weapons to help us uh, with, our, with technology. We need the technology to stop it. Also, have you had voice the skull, Catherine? I had it 
once. Um, I certainly, actually, I had voice to scale, and I had the, the the next level up, which is image to scale, and I'm still figuring out how they did that. So, voice to scale, um, for those who don't know, is ancient. The patent was, I think, the 1960s or 70s, and essentially, if you use intense microwave beams, you can use essentially um, um, beam sound into someone's head, not using the hearing. Um, and I had that once when they had a very intense tone, um, which they essentially beamed into next to my left ear. And that already was, you know, quite shocking. But at the time, so I'll show people, um, this expression tin for a hat essentially comes from, you know, as, I, as far as I can tell, the CIA trying to um, smear the attempts of victims, you know, who are trying to protect themselves against the early experiments. So sometimes what I sleep with is literally a helmet like that. As ridiculous as that might um, look, and at the time when they did voice to skull, I had something like that next to me, and I put it on my head to cover my ears, but I still heard the note, and then I pushed it further down, and as soon as it covered my neck, the tone disappeared. So I, it could have been that the microwave beam was coming through the back of my head. I don't know. it. They could have just switched off the beam. I'm not sure this, if this is enough to block it out, but if it's a microwave beam, metal must be able to block it out unless someone has a you know a, um, a, an implant and it's using some sort of mobile phone signal which right. is a lot more diffuse but i i um in a sense every single time we talk about voice to skull i encourage anybody who suffers from this to experiment around trying to block out the sound because it must be some sort of beam so try to wrap your head um, you know, entirely so that there's no way for them to essentially um, beam electromagnetic radiation in. And I think the easiest way to do that is literally with aluminum foil. But you have to make sure that you don't leave any gaps or small holes, so several layers, you know. Right. And um, if, if people, for example, if people found a way to just block it out for the night, I think already that would help a lot, a lot of them. Um, but ultimately, the, the only solution is to make the intelligence agencies stop, you know. I mean, so many times I, I talk to high-profile whistleblowers and they continue about what sort of ways we can find to block this. And I keep saying, well, this is like saying we've got a lone gunman, you know, on the loose in the mall, and then you're telling single moms how to build a tank to go grocery shopping in, you know. That's not the solution. The solution is to stop these idiots, you know. <laughs> the tinfoil hat thing is interesting because that's that's part of gaslighting. See what they what they do also with with you and other TIs is they say you're crazy, and yeah. they, they turn people against you. You know it's a, it's called gaslighting, and it's it's been common for a long time. But uh, the tinfoil hat, yeah, we're tinfoil exactly. hats. Exactly. Yeah, we're trying and to protect ourselves from intelligence. Exactly, agents. and I think you know what because. Um, I, there's something that um, there's the um, uh, Catherine Austin Fitz. She's also on online. She's one of the most intelligent women online, yes. I think. Yes. But she calls it the Shriekometer, you know. And I found that as soon as I made um, videos where I publicly talked about, yes, I'm trying to protect my head with it. All these bots and fake accounts were shrieking at me, or oh, tin for hat, tin for hat. And then I discovered, hang on, if they're that sensitive about it, it must actually be pretty good protection. They are trying to keep us from using simple right. protection. Right. And from now on, my strategy is to just, no, I'm not ashamed anymore. And I always say, hang on, tin fall, there hasn't been any tin in it right. since like the 1960s. Right. So if you don't call it aluminum fall, you must be trying to prime me right. towards tin fall hat, you know? Especially young people, you know, when they call it, oh, actually, there was um, on my YouTube channel, there's um, one incident where the police officers, I, I was assaulted in, in the United Kingdom, and I tried to report it to the police. The police sent me home, preventing me from talking to an officer, and hours later, they sent a, sent a mental health ambulance. And then, you know, these police officers and these ambulance staff arrived and were trying to intimidate me, and I actually filmed the entire exchange and put it online. But there's one police officer, actually a young chap, who keeps, um, I had aluminium next to my bed to protect myself, and he keeps pointing at it, and he says, so what's it with the tin foil then? And I thought that's very interesting for a young chap in his 20s in the UK to refer to this tin foil, because it's aluminium foil, right? right? It's either baking foil, aluminium foil. So the fact that he said tin foil, I thought, oh, this, this must be the MI5 guy, you know, trying to just... He's like, she's mad, she's mad, I'm sorry, they just gave it away, you know. <laughs> well, you know that uh, 
the uh, NSA, CIA, and all the intelligence agencies, they're all on Twitter and Facebook. And I always look for my first couple negative comments on my videos because I know they've got to, they get paid to do this. They're sitting in yeah. their offices. So I don't take that, I don't take that very seriously at all. And I encourage everybody not to take it seriously. When people like uh, Catherine are coming forward and it's obvious if you listen to her for the last hour that she's not crazy. She's <clears throat> got her act together and she's mounting an attack on something that's threatening the lives of all of us. There, you, can't have a, you can't have a society that's run by a secretive intelligent mafia that yeah. traffics people and targets people um, and makes them, makes them victims for uh, insane little um, uh, physical experiments on people. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's what we have to stop. And, and uh, I think there's a bunch of ways we can get a handle on it. After talking to you for, for a while, it sounds actually pretty encouraging. It is. I think we've got lots of ways, and I think we'll, as soon as people come on board, they will bring their own creativity into tackling this, and we'll have more and more ideas. So essentially, that's what we'll see. We'll see a turn on curve. Um, so from now on, I'll only report about you know progress <laughs> and what we can do. It should be an you know it should be an exchange of ideas, and also it should be the most um, I think most encouraging and most humane activity we have done as mankind for in a long time. I think last time we all got together was in, in the Second World War, trying to defeat evil, and in a sense we've now got um, another chance to show our humanity right. by reaching out. And as I keep saying, now the targeting of people is now the occasion that we rise, but really we should have risen already with the, the child abuse. Why did we not speak right. up? Or with the financial crisis, or 9-11. Right. Why did we not rise earlier. So, you know. <laughs> well, I think there's a big difference between us and World War II. World War II, they had us fighting one another. There were bad guys and good guys, and now we know there's yeah. us and them. And yeah. I think it's a totally different ball game now, and I think that we've got a really good shot if we can mobilize and not look at the big money and the big hierarchies and realize that people power, people getting together is the most powerful thing. I wish I could take people back to my experience in those 10 years working with those organizations and uh, how when we would take down the uh, psychopath magnets, which are the big power, because power, if, if, a, if a psychopath isn't in it, the next psychopath by is going to be in it because they're ruthless. They'll do anything yep. to get there. So taking those down and working uh, from the grassroots, this is really grassroots, what you're, yeah. what you're advocating. Uh, actually, you know, I think you should, make, you should make a couple of videos and actually share your experience because it sounds like you have such a wealth of experience and we really need to hear this now, you know. So I, I, I actually, maybe I should interview you next week, you know, to actually hear this because this is what we need to be doing exactly the same as what we did with companies. We need to do it with our public institutions now as well, I think. I think it sounds like a great idea. I'm willing to do it whenever you are. Absolutely. So let's do that. That's it. it. <laughs> this will be the blueprint. <laughs> you tell okay. us how to do it. <laughs> no, because I just, you know, I'm just trying. I'm just muddling my way through. But you're the professional. I mean, you know how to do it. So you should teach us, you know. Well, I have scars all over me from learning. <laughs> I can't imagine, dogs, but sure. you know, they prepared you for this. They prepared me for this. Wow, this has been an amazing interview. I was, when I listened to the last half of your interview with, with Richie Allen, I was blown away. I mean, you were so inspiring and so uplifting and so strong. I was really motivated. That's why I really insisted on, uh, on working with you and continuing to work with you, hopefully this year as we get this thing mm -hmm. off the ground. Um, yeah. did, do you have anything else to say at the, at the end here? Uh, I want to make sure well, people get to your website, stop007.com, but okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. One of the things I'm burning to say, actually, it's just, it just occurred to me as you said that I'm really strong. You know what? One of the confessions I have to make is that um, the way I appear publicly, I 
actually learned that from another very inspiring woman who I think people should also know about, and that's Karen Hooters. Because Karen Hooters um, is now fighting, essentially, to save our monetary system. She's fighting to avert World War III. And it was essentially from her that I learned that you should just put everything out there to the public and should also make everything that happens to you public. And most people thought, oh, you know, the stories she's telling are so out there, so crazy. But I looked into it and I can tell, no, they are true. They are true. And Karen Hudis, there, there's some key people right now in our society who are fighting for the system cycle. And she's trying to cycle the monetary system. And essentially what she's doing is, is intimately linked with our problems with the intelligence agencies because it's the banks who own the intelligence agencies as far as I can right. tell. So if we switched off the money, we solve these problems. So in a sense, what we should really do is all interlink. You know, everything we're doing, what Karen Hudis does, what I'm doing, it's all one big thing. Right. She'll point back to Homo Carpensis, which is, <laughs> have you heard of this? Um, I, I think so, I think so. They're but the long-skulled uh, creatures. Oh, are... actually, you know what, that, um, I think I understood what, uh, what happened there, because she did say that for some time, and then she said, oh, a disinformation agent got to her. Oh. And I think, I think so, because I, I, I um, watched that, and she was going on about the cone heads and how they are somehow intellectual. And I think the, the actual science on that is still kind of shady. Right. So she withdrew that. She's now focusing on, on the finance. But when she said a disinformation agent got to her, I was actually wondering if this wasn't a CIA attempt to essentially, um, because one of the things that they try to do with me, this, uh, I mentioned the image to skull is that they don't just send voices, they can flash images. And I'm still figuring out how they do that. If they actually um, flash my optical nerve, or if I maybe have a small implant, I don't know. But they started flashing just brief images, but nonsense, really. And it's, it's almost like you close your eyes and you see a movie. So it's not your internal um, dialogue or anything internal to your brain. I just thought, oh, here we go again. But one of the things I noticed, and I know from other victims, is that they try to train our brains in our sleep. So the ultimate goal is to control us and to essentially make our brains learn to respond to images whilst we are unconscious and we're sleeping. And I'm actually wondering if Karen might not have been essentially brain trained to believe that because she was attacked in many other ways. I mean, they break into her home. She was attacked in August with, um, uh, well, with directed energy weapons so that it looked almost like she had a stroke without her having a stroke. So she is so important, she's attacked extremely badly. So it tells us that what she's doing is essentially right. spot on. Well, thank you very much. Anything else before we go? Oh, no, no, I think I kept your listeners for long enough. You, know? no, you, were, you were wonderful, very inspiring, and thank you very much. And I want to keep uh, this relationship going, and we're going to do more stuff in the future. So thank, thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you very, very much. much. Thank you, Kelly. <laughs> bye bye. Take care. Bye for now. Bye. bye.